This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 20, King of the World. Last episode, the demon Maya, at Krishna's suggestion, built a magnificent palace for King Yudhishthira. The Dharma king threw a big party on its completion, and Narada came by to tell him just how this new palace rated among all the palaces in the three worlds. As the wandering sage described who lived in each palace, Yudhishthira couldn't help but notice that even the great kings of history were all relegated to the underworld, in Yama's palace of the dead. Apparently, only one king had made it to heaven. Naturally, Yudhishthira wanted to be like that king, so he asked Narada how this one king had found a way to live among the gods with Indra. Narada's answer was seemingly simple. This king, Harishchandra, had performed the Rajasuya sacrifice, and had received the keys to heaven as a result. It turns out, however, that in order to successfully complete the Rajasuya, or imperial consecration, you first need to conquer the world. Presumably, Yudhishthira would have looked for an easier way out, but just then his father, Pandu, spoke to him from beyond the grave, encouraging him to proceed with the sacrifice. That settled the matter for the pious king. How could he possibly deny his father's wishes? The Mahabharata never really provides all the fine print regarding the sacrifice. At first, it is described as merely consisting of holding six ritual fires that are attended by scrupulous Brahmins. A little while later, they tell Yudhishthira that you also need to conquer the world and gain the assent of all the world's kings as part of the rite. According to one of our translators, J.A.B. Van Buitenen, the Rajasuya ritual probably also included a dice game. Yudhishthira will indeed end up playing a dice game, but the Mahabharata does not say that it was technically part of the sacrifice. More on that later. In any case, Yudhishthira follows Krishna's advice and sends his brothers and cousin to Magadha to kill Jarasand and gain the allegiance of all the kings held in Jarasand's prisons. One other interesting thing to come up in the last episode was Krishna's sudden promotion and status. By including a number of episodes about Krishna's life from other sources, I have inadvertently changed the way listeners were traditionally introduced to Krishna in the Mahabharata. If I had only given you accounts from the Mahabharata, Krishna's status would have seemed inexplicable. Traditional society was always very hierarchical, with princes taking precedence over nobles, elders over the youth, men over women, freedmen over slaves, etc. These rankings were extremely important to the functioning of society at this time. Thus, Yudhishthira had unquestioned priority among his brothers, but when his uncles or Narada showed up, he gave up his seat in their favor. This makes Krishna's status quite exceptional, especially beginning with Book 2. Technically, Krishna's status should be something like that of the Pandava's poorer cousin. He was not a prince, and was moreover from a lesser kingdom. Thus, he would have been welcome in the Pandava's palace, and included in any deliberations, but he would always come after his cousins in precedence. Thus, it is a little surprising, but not overly out of the ordinary, when Yudhishthira appoints Krishna to lead the delegation of his two brothers to fight Jarasand in Magadha. Things get more surprising once the trio arrive in Magadha, however. We are told that Krishna and Arjun were the same age, while Bhima was the elder. But despite this, Krishna speaks for all three when they encounter Jarasand. Following Bhima's victory over Jarasand, it is Krishna who takes charge ordering the release of the imprisoned kings and making an alliance with Jarasand's son and successor, Sahadev. If it were any other person, one would have expected Bhima to have been the leader, and even if Krishna were allowed to speak for him, all decisions would have been deferred to the eldest and noblest of the three. Instead, it is the poor country cousin Krishna who does all the talking and makes all the decisions. If we didn't already know about Krishna's miracles in Gokula and Mathura, which were not mentioned in the Mahabharata, we would be shocked to see the world of princes and nobles turned upside down like this. Later this episode, one of Krishna's old rivals, Sishu Palapchedi, will speak up on just this point. Once Krishna, Bhima, and Arjun returned successfully from their mission to Magadha, Yudhishthira sent his four brothers off once more, this time to complete their conquest of the world. Each brother took an army and headed in a different direction. Arjun headed north, Bhima going east, Sahadev south, and Nakul heading west. Arjun's campaign led him along the Himalayas, through Kashmir, and then northward into Central Asia, defeating some in battle and extracting tribute from the rest. Bhima Sena headed east, skipping past allies such as Hastinapur and Panchala, and doing battle with neutral states like Kashi. An interesting side note is that Bhima encountered Karna, the king of Anga, and beat him easily. 
Later, this friend of Duryodhana will be portrayed as a near match to Arjun in battle. But somehow Bhima had a pretty easy time of it, and the victory is only mentioned in passing. Bhima pushed on at least as far as the Brahmaputra River Delta, winning vast amounts of tribute from all these kingdoms. Sahadev brought his army southward, defeating many kings and kingdoms along the way, until he crossed the Narmada River and got held up while besieging the city of Mahishmati. When they attempted to fight the defending armies of King Nila, their equipment and chariots kept bursting into flames. It isn't quite clear how Sahadev figured out that he was being attacked by the fire god himself, but Vaisampayana tells us that Agni was King Nila's ally and gives us the backstory. I actually have two versions of this story, one from the critical edition and the other from the Bombay edition. Starting with the critical edition, we are told that sometime in the past, Agni had come to the city of Mahashmati in the guise of a Brahmin and was caught carousing with the women of the city. His divinity not being recognized by the constables, Agni was arrested and arraigned before King Nila. The king lectured the Brahmin on his immoral behavior, and then Agni flared up in anger. This burst of supernatural flames revealed Agni's true identity, and the wise king quickly jumped down and prostrated himself before the god of the sacrifices. King Nila's show of contrition inspired Agni to grant him one wish. The king's wish was that Agni would forever protect his army. Agni was also grateful to the women folk for their hospitality, so he granted them independence from their men, allowing them to be their own masters and to run about freely. Vaisampayana then pointed out that this was the reason the other kings of India assiduously avoided the loose women of Mahashmati. The Bombay edition says Agni had been particularly interested in the king's daughter, and it was with her that he had been caught carousing. This alternate version also states more explicitly that the women of this kingdom were sexually liberated, and even married women were not required to be faithful to their husbands. It is not stated how Sahadev figured all this out, but he did, and in response, he presented himself before the sacrificial flame and prayed to the fire god. Since Agni is, of necessity, the primary beneficiary of any Vedic sacrifice, Sahadev explained to Agni that his only desire in waging this war was to complete a fire sacrifice, so Agni should not be actively preventing this ritual from taking place. He begged the lord of the sacrifice, saying, I pray to you, the bearer of the offering, to refrain from obstructing the sacrifice. Agni then whispered in Sahadev's ear, saying, Rise up, Karavya, I was only testing you. I am fully aware of your campaign and King Dharma's goal. But I am also obligated to King Nila to protect this city. Still, I shall do what your heart desires. Agni then departed and persuaded King Nila to simply give in to Sahadev and hand over to him the customary tribute. Thus allied with King Nila, Sahadev pressed southward, conquering the kingdoms of South India and then proceeded across the sea to take on the barbarians, such as the folk with ears so big they used them as hats, the black-faced men who were descended from Rakshasas, the one-footed folk who lived in the bush, and finally he conquered Rome, Antioch, and the city of the Greeks. As for Nakula, he led his army westward, fighting and defeating the kings of the Indus Plains. Nakula also sent envoys south to Dwarka, where Krishna's people readily sent tribute. The westward campaign led as far as the Persian Gulf, where the barbarians of that region were subjugated, and then they returned home, with 10,000 camels bearing tribute and booty. During these years, while the four brothers were off subjugating the four directions, Yudhishthira was ruling a peaceful, prosperous realm. We are told that, because of the correct collection of revenues and law-abiding government, the monsoon rained abundantly and the countryside was fattened. The combined wealth of booty, tribute, and taxation amounted to a surplus that could not be spent in 100 years. We can imagine the deflationary effect that such a massive hoard of treasure would have on the economy of India. Gold and precious metals would have been out of circulation and sitting in Indoprastha's treasury. It was time to put all that back in circulation with a massive giveaway. Yudhishthira decided it was time to carry out the Rajasuya sacrifice. The king naturally checked in with his brothers, advisors, and Krishna to make sure he had their consent, and then sent out messengers to the kings, brahmins, and notables of the world to come attend his ceremony. Nakula was sent to Hastinapur in person to invite their Kuru relations, including their gurus Drona and Kripa, Bhishma, King Dhritarashtra, and his 100 sons. 
Among the other nobles in attendance, Duryodhana's uncle Shakuni also attended. The Mahabharata provides a very long list of the kings who attended this ritual, but suffice it to say that everyone who was anyone was there, including Krishna's old rival, King Sishupal of Chedi. Recall that Sishupal was once engaged to Krishna's wife, Rukmini, before she was abducted by Krishna. He was also King Jarasand's marshal during the wars against Mathura, and the ally of Rukmini's brother, Rukmi, who was killed at some point by Balram. It would be an understatement to say he still bore a grudge against Krishna. All of Yudhishthira's Kuru relations were assigned to honorable duties, with the Brahmins Drona and Kripa put in charge of supervising the rituals, while Bhishma was president of the secular portions of the ceremony. Cousin Dushasan was put in charge of the kitchen, and Duryodhana oversaw the doling out of treasure. Blind King Dhritarashtra presided in a seat of honor. Also attending the ritual were the sages Narada and Vyasa. Vyasa himself was the chief priest in charge of performing the ritual. As the six fires of the Rajasuya were completed, sage Narada saw through all the kings and celebrities in attendance and realized that before him were the numerous incarnated gods and asuras. He also identified Hari Narayan among them in the person of Krishna and observed how the race of Kshatriyas was destined to die at the hands of this noble company, saying to himself, O oh, woe, the self-created God himself will once more carry off this powerful nobility that has grown so great. Then Bhishma announced that it was time for the presentation of the guest gift. Bhishma said, The guest gift was traditionally given to the kings who stayed in attendance longer than one year but the first gift should be presented to the most honorable of the guests. King Yudhishthira then asked Bhishma to identify the most deserving guest among them. Bhishma naturally chose Krishna for that special honor. Sahadev then presented the guest gift to Krishna. Once again, the natural ordering of society was upset. How could one justifiably honor a former cowherder of questionable descent before all the greatest kings of India? The person most outraged by this was none other than Sushupal of Chedi, Rukmini's former fiancé and King Jarasan's former general. Sushupal outright refused to consent to this honor being given to Krishna in his presence. He stood up and recited a long list of reasons why Krishna was not worthy and why the rest of the kings there should not allow this travesty to go forward. Sushupal's first arguments were about rank. Krishna was not a king, and should not presume to take precedence before the kings of India. Also, his own king was present, as well as his father and older brother, all of whom should naturally take precedence before him. Sishupal considered Bhishma's decision to be an insult to all the kings present, and he angrily walked out of the proceeding. Yudhishthira anxiously ran after Sishupal, trying to pacify him by saying Bhishma's decisions ought to be respected. But Bhishma himself was simply ticked off and he called Sishupal ignorant and out of line for presuming to criticize his decision. Bhishma then gave a long defense of his decision, describing in summary Krishna's many miracles and heroic feats, and extolling his wisdom, power, and divinity. Sahadev, who was trying to properly perform the giving of the guest gift to Krishna, then challenged the nobles in attendance to deny Krishna's place of honor, saying he would put his foot on the head of anyone who dared. While all the kings sat in a sullen silence, flowers rained down on Sahadev from heaven. Sahadev then completed the ceremony with Krishna. Meanwhile, Sishupal continued to stir up trouble among the kings, trying to organize a disruption of the Rajasuya by fomenting rebellion among the attendees. Soon, many of the kings were grumbling and preparing to walk out on the ceremony. Yudhishthira became worried that his big event might come to naught, so he turned to Bhishma for advice on handling this unruly crowd. Bhishma told him not to worry. Krishna would handle this himself before things really got out of control. So Sishupal was allowed to continue. The angry prince of Chedi next complained about Krishna's so-called miracles, referring to his victories over the various demons in Gokula as merely the killing of animals, women, and damaging a wooden ox cart. He also argued that by killing King Kamsa, Krishna had committed treason and regicide. Finally, Sishupal brought up the case of Jarasan's death. He pointed out that Krishna had committed a fraud by pretending to be a Brahmin and had abused Jarasan's famous hospitality. He said that Jarasan declined to fight Krishna because he would never stoop so low as to fight a Shudra. 
Sishu Paul implied that if Krishna really was the miracle man they said he was, then why did he need to resort to trickery and fraud to kill the good king Jarasan? At the mention of Jarasan's death, Bhima grew irate. He was, after all, the champion who had defeated the king in a fair fight. Bhishma had to get up and restrain his nephew. To calm him down, Bhishma then told them the story of Sishupal's birth. Bhishma revealed that Sishupal had been born with three eyes and four arms, and that he brayed like a donkey. His parents wanted to abandon this abomination, but the famous disembodied voice spoke up and told them that they were not destined to be the cause of Sishupal's death. The voice said that the baby could be cured if it were placed in the lap of the person destined to kill him. It so happened that Krishna's aunt Yadavi was married into the house of Chedi, and thus Vasudev, Krishna, and Balram were in town on a visit. The queen of Chedi, looking for a cure for her child, put the baby in Krishna's lap. Instantly, the superfluous arms and third eye disappeared. The queen mother was delighted to have discovered the cure for her son, but at the same time she was horrified to have discovered his killer. She begged Krishna to be merciful and to spare her son. Krishna told her not to worry. He would tolerate even 100 insults from her son. Bhishma then concluded that none of this could be happening unless it was part of Krishna's plan, so they should all restrain themselves and see how things played out. Sishupal, presumably annoyed to have his birth defects revealed in such a public manner, turned on Bhishma, insulting him for his impotence and dependence on others. He then challenged Krishna to a duel or a battle to the death, insisting that the kings should organize themselves and kill not only Krishna, but also the Pandavas for the temerity. Finally, Krishna spoke up, but in a quiet voice, he said, Princes, Sishupal is our bitter enemy, though we have done him no wrong. He then listed a number of crimes committed by Sishupal that we otherwise have no record of, including charges that he had burned Dwarka while the Yadus were away, and that he had ambushed the Bhujas when they were on vacation and that he had disrupted Ugrasena's horse sacrifice by kidnapping the horse. Krishna said that he had tolerated Sishupal so far out of consideration for his mother, but that he was now crossing the line. He brought up the fact that Sishupal had been an unworthy suitor for Rukmini, Krishna's wife. At the mention of Rukmini, Sishupal laughed at Krishna, saying that by the time Krishna had married Rukmini, she was already damaged goods. As these words left his mouth, Krishna's Sudarshan Chakra came flying and cut off his head. Sishupal's headless corpse fell to the ground, and while the kings watched in stunned silence, a sublime radiance rose up from the dead prince and entered into Krishna. Rain fell from the cloudless sky, and lightning and thunder shook the ground in all directions. Some of the attendees were happy to see this outcome, but most were ambivalent. Some were quite outraged, but they were all too intimidated to speak out. There are some great images of this scene on the web, so I'll post links to these in my blog. Be sure to log into MahabharataPodcast.com and look up episode 20 to see these pictures. Now that Krishna was the unofficial enforcer for the ceremony, the rest of the ritual was carried out uneventfully. At the completion of the ritual, the kings and nobles congratulated Yudhishthira for having attained the imperial consecration and began setting out for their respective homelands. Soon after, Krishna also returned to Dwarka with his fellow Yadavas. Around this time, Vyasa came before the king, asking for permission to leave for Mount Kailash. Before dismissing the sage, Yudhishthira asked him about a prediction that Narada had made sometime earlier regarding this sacrifice. Narada had said that three kinds of portents would take place as a result of the Rajasuya, celestial, atmospheric, and terrestrial. He asked Vyasa if the killing of Sishupal marked the end of these troubles. Vyasa answered that the trouble had only just begun and would continue on for another 13 years and would result in great destruction. He warned the king that these events were unavoidable and so he should just rule the earth with justice and vigilance and patiently bear every privation. This dark prediction deeply disturbed Yudhishthira, and his first reaction was to think of a way of killing himself, so he could save the world's nobility from destruction. His brothers quickly dissuaded him from this course, telling him that his fate could not and should not be avoided. In response, the king swore an oath to his brothers, saying, For the next thirteen years I shall never speak a hard word to my brothers or to any king. 
I will live under the command of my relatives. If I live this way, making no distinction between my own children and others, there will be no conflict. It is disagreement that is the cause of war in the world. Keeping war at a distance, and always doing what is agreeable to others, evil reputation will not be mine in the world. In other words, bad shit might go down, but he wanted to be sure no one blamed him for it. After Vyasa's departure, only Duryodhana and his uncle Shakuni remained as guests in Yudhishthira's palace. The Karava wandered the otherworldly palace like a country bumpkin. He came across floors of crystal so clear that he thought it was a pool, and he picked up his trousers to cross the water, only to discover it was hard ground. There were windows and doors of clear glass that he crashed right into, and that made him overly cautious when he came to open corridors. The servants and guests snickered at him as he encountered these illusions like a rube. At one point, he came across another of these clear floors and assumed it was another crystal surface. He walked across it and fell into a pool of water. The servants laughed and brought him towels to dry off, and seeing him all wet, Bhima, Arjun, and the twins all laughed at him. Resentful and humiliated, Duryodhana left Indrapasta and returned home, accompanied by his uncle Shakuni. We'll see how Duryodhana responds to these humiliations next time. For now, I should only mention that this scene in the Pandava's palace seems to have changed over the years. In both of the versions I have of the Mahabharata, Duryodhana was laughed at only by his male cousins. No mention is made of either Yudhishthira or Draupadi. It is interesting that the Bhagavata Purana, which was written much later, adds Draupadi to the scene and has her laughing the loudest at Duryodhana's follies. This theme gets expanded on even more in the Hindi TV series, where the only person laughing was Draupadi, and she laughs a long time. The TV series even invents a later scene in which Yudhishthira scolds Draupadi for having laughed at her cousin like that, and he predicts bad things to come. Next time, we'll hear all about the bad things yet to come. Duryodhana will not take these humiliations lying down, and his uncle Shakuni happens to be an expert dice player. Thanks for listening.